unplugged in, going back to school, and dealing with coronavirus. The pandemic in March forcing more than one million children out of schools and into an array of education options, including none at all. Now the challenge is ahead from kindergarten to college to keep students, teachers, and parents safe and healthy. My interview with the director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Robert Redfield, on how best to reopen schools and the measures we need to take to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Unplugged in, coronavirus, back to school. Hello, welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from my home in Washington, D.C. 2020's extended summer vacation is coming to an end with many questions about how students will go back to school amid the coronavirus pandemic. Schools have reopened in parts of Thailand and Malaysia, but a spike in cases in Hong Kong closed schools there shortly after reopening. Going back to school in South Africa means signing a letter of consent with squirts of hand sanitizer. In Brazil, children wear face masks and shields while keeping their distance. Opening schools is key for economic recovery, providing necessary childcare to enable parents to go back to work. In the United States, public school systems, colleges, and universities are scrambling to determine the right balance between classroom and distance learning. In just a few minutes, I will discuss best practices for going back to school with Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the Centers for Disease Control, America's Health Protection Agency. First, VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara on the social, economic, and political pressures to reopen schools. In the state of New Hampshire, a school using ski lifts for a graduation ceremony to help maintain social distancing, just one of the creative measures American schools have taken during the pandemic. But beyond pomp and circumstance, American schools may soon reopen for a new school year. President Trump is demanding that it happen on time in August or September. We're very much going to put pressure on uh, governors and everybody else to open the schools. Schools are part of the president's larger plan to resume normal economic function as he eyes his re-election bid in November. Children back in school would allow parents to go back to their workplaces. The more than 50 million children who attend school in the U.S. did so online after the pandemic hit and before their summer vacations. The American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended they return to school in some form to keep them from falling behind, a recommendation supported by infectious disease experts. I think most of us agree that we have to open up our schools again this fall, but we'll see exactly how to do it, doing it carefully, is very important. But according to a research by the American Enterprise Institute, only 20% of parents feel safe sending their children back to a school building. Republican parents are twice as likely as Democrats to feel okay doing so. Mixed messaging from federal and state officials on precautions such as masks have contributed to parents' anxiety. Reopening of schools isn't just purely a decision that's made by governors and superintendents and principals and teachers. It's a decision that parents have to participate in as well. They have to trust that uh, the schools are putting in place uh, the protections that are going to keep their kids safe. And the problem is when you have conflicting guidance, uh, it it creates this untenable situation for parents to try to make a decision uh, with with varying types of of, of conflicting guidance on uh, whether or not uh, a school should do X, Y, or Z. While the coronavirus rarely causes illness in children, there is concern they may transmit the virus to family members like they do with the flu. We don't know that yet about the COVID virus. Does it really infect the children and they can transmit it? Or is it very difficult for this virus to infect children? Those studies are still underway. Beyond the $13 billion allocated in April to help schools and universities move to online learning, it's unclear whether the federal government plans to provide additional funding to safely reopen schools. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. It is estimated that it will cost an average-sized U.S. school district nearly $1.8 million to reopen. Included in that price tag, nearly $40,000 for hand sanitizers, $148,000 for disposable face masks for students who forget or don't bring one from home, 
and $448,000 to hire people to clean and disinfect schools and buses. The Centers for Disease Control is the U.S. government agency whose mission is to protect the public health. It has published a checklist for schools to use to prepare to reopen. Among the CDC's considerations, staggering the times for students to arrive and leave school, installing physical barriers when social distancing is difficult, and keeping doors and windows open as often as possible for fresh air to circulate. Dr. Robert Redfield is the director of the CDC. He has been involved in research of viral infections for more than 30 years. We talked about what it's going to take to get students back to school. All right, let me turn to schools, which is a huge issue here in this country, is that how, what's, how do you figure out um, whether to open schools, not to open schools? We've got public health, we've got the economy, we've got school, we've got this, this tough balance. And I guess for a starter question, do kids transmit to kids? You know, right now we don't have a lot of evidence that kids are a critical component of what we call the transmission cycle of this virus. And that would include uh, to adults too? Yeah, unlike flu, where we know that, you know, childhood school transmission of flu can really seed outbreaks in the community. We really don't have that evidence here. We don't have it in our household studies that we've done where we've looked at who's bringing the virus into the household. It's usually the adult that's bringing the virus into the household. The other thing that we know is that children really, um, one of the things that's unique about this virus is it can go anything from nothing, no symptoms, all the way to make you critically ill and need to be intubated. It's spectrum of illness, as, as Tony says, is, and I say is really some of the Plus largest we've ever does seen. does damage on different organs. It right. might be your, your heart, my lungs. Very, very large, and as you said, it's got some in interesting uh, complications with causing coagulopathies and problem with different organs. When we look at kids in general, uh, and individuals under the age of 45, pretty much in the absence of significant medical conditions, this is really an asymptomatic illness. We've looked at, of the individuals under 18, we've had 52, I think, individuals under 18 that have died, many of which have other comorbidities out of the first, say, 118,000 that we've looked at. So if you look at that, the risk of mortality for individuals under 18 right now is about 0.1 per 100,000, or about one in a million with the data that we have right now, as opposed to those people that are over 75, where the risk is really much, much greater, so, about 3,000 per 100,000. So do you feel comfortable opening schools? Absolutely. And even if you feel, absolutely? Absolutely. Here's what you I feel. You feel absolutely comfortable. Yes. Uh, what I feel is this, um, it has to be done safely. My biggest concern about opening schools is making sure we protect the vulnerable, that we're protecting the teachers and we're protecting the children that are vulnerable. I would argue that the public health risk, because I don't think it's public health versus opening schools, I think it's public health versus public health. I think the public health risk to K through 12s of continuing to have these schools closed is real. Whether it's the absence of mental health services for the 7.1 million kids who get their mental health service in school, whether it's the nutritional services that some of the kids get, whether it's the fact that this is where most of our mandatory reporting for sexual abuse and child abuse is, whether it's the impact of socialization, whether it's really a lot of kids just learn better face to face. Um, so when I look at the relative risk of say death of COVID among kids and compare that to the relative risk of flu, you're far more likely as a child to die from flu. And that's even in an environment where we have a vaccine that if you took, you wouldn't have been at risk. So I think it really is times. Now, each jurisdiction is going to have to work through it. They're going to have to figure out exactly, you know, we've given guidance and that's just what it is. It's guidance. Uh, I've said it's guidance to help facilitate the opening of schools. I don't want to see it be as a, a guidance that's a rationale to keep schools closed. And we'll work with the school districts on how to take our guidance and operationalize it in a practical way to get these schools open. But yes, I think it is from strictly a public health point of view. We're not going to get into the larger debate, but from a public health point of view, I think it is um, um, extremely important that we open these schools. The vigilance, though, that has to be there is to make sure we're protecting the vulnerable teachers, making sure we have alternatives for children that are vulnerable because of their medical conditions. Um, 
But I think we can do this in a very thoughtful, safe way. I had more from Dr. Redfield about developing new treatments and a vaccine for COVID. But first, among the consequences of the world's focus on coronavirus are many people who are not being treated for any number of medical conditions. VOA medical correspondent Carol Pearson reports the impact is felt most by women and children. It's nighttime in Nairobi, and a pregnant woman is in labor. An ambulance service started by health workers takes her to the hospital. When the government imposed a curfew to contain the coronavirus pandemic, doctors noticed an increase in deaths of women giving birth alone at home. So they moved into action to save women's lives. Maternity-related cases has, has gone higher. On average, we're doing two calls per night. What's happening in Nairobi is happening worldwide, even in rich countries. A UN report shows that health services are being taken away from women, children under the age of five, and adolescents in order to fight the coronavirus pandemic. The consequences are devastating. Initial estimates uh, are projecting that we're going to see um, major impact on under five mortality rates, um, mortality rates for newborns, uh, for maternal mortality, uh, the numbers of malnourished children, uh, children who are exposed to uh, abuse and violence, um, critical loss of access to women's health, uh, etc. So um, the estimates are quite dire the report estimates that nearly 400 million children are going hungry because they're missing meals at schools that are closed. 13 million children are missing vaccinations. Some parents are afraid to take their children to get their shots, and some countries have a shortage of vaccines. The risk of a new um, and renewed uh, outbreak uh, of measles, polio, and uh, all these other infectious diseases is actually real, and it's something that we need to be prepared for. The report also finds that women and girls worldwide are experiencing higher rates of abuse, increased pregnancies, less access to reproductive services, and along with that, more mothers are dying from complications of childbirth. Dr. Ali Pui says a vaccine, once developed, will end the COVID-19 crisis. But rich countries, he says, will have to help the poorer countries strengthen their health systems because the pandemic will leave the poor even more destitute than before. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. It will likely take a medical breakthrough to get school, the economy, and so much of everyday life back to some sort of normal. I asked Dr. Robert Redfield where we stand on developing a vaccine and other treatments for coronavirus. I want to talk about vaccines and where we are, but before that, since we have so many hot spots in the world, is that people are obviously worried about vaccines, but they're also worried in the short time about treatments. And it's it seems to me that the one that's that seems to have the most faith, at least in, in the public domain right now, might be is remdesivir, uh, which was developed for Ebola. Am I right that that sort of is the leading contender, but we're always looking for more and better? Well, it's the important first step. I mean, remdesivir is an important step, which has been shown and proven now to actually have improvement. It can lower the length of stay in individuals in intensive care and a very special subgroup if it started at the right time, it does appear to actually decrease mortality. Important advancement, that's out now and, being And is used. that because it's sort of like Tamiflu to the flu, it reduces the viral load, so if you have less viruses in your system, you're less likely to get so sick? It clearly is antiviral, that's how it works. Uh, its challenge is once you've already, uh, when this virus uh, causes infection in your body, it gets to a stage then actually what's really causing disease for you is not the virus, but your body's response to it, the inflammation. So when you're in that inflammation phase, remdesivir isn't gonna work so much. That's when you heard the recent data about steroids. Steroids were helping save lives when you're in the inflammation phase. Remdesivir helps when you're in the 
viral replication phase. Which is why then the popularity of dexamethasone, mm -hmm. which is the steroid that's been around forever, so that, um, so that it tells your body, your immune system, quit inflaming. Yeah, quit inflaming. It tells you a lot about the pathogenesis. When Tony and I saw that data come out about dexamethasone, we immediately said, you know, okay, it confirms our suspicions in, in the pathogenesis that when we see patients starting getting better, and then all of a sudden they crash, very rapidly, uh, say day 9, 10, 11, that's really their body causing a pro-inflammatory response in their lungs, causing pulmonary insufficiency. Steroids work there. Now, there's other therapies that are coming on the, on the line right now. They're under evaluation. Taking the serum plasma from people that have convalesced infection. And right now, there's a large trial, over 30,000 people that have been receiving the plasma of individuals that have recovered to see if that can but provide antibodies that will provide benefit to those individuals. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is another drug that we've heard a lot about. In the beginning, it was um, given a lot of attention, then people backed off, then you hear a little bit more about it. Uh, what is sort of the current state of affairs with hydroxychloroquine? And, and is it prophylactic or is it a treatment once you have it? Yeah, I think the, the key here is looking at the controlled clinical trials. And as you know, you have um, some that clearly have not shown benefit. You had a recent one announced in Detroit where there was some benefit earlier on. Uh, this sort of falls into the ra range right now until, until the date is definitive of what I call clinical judgment. You know, I'm a physician, an internist, infectious disease, um, and I think each individual clinician makes a decision with their patient about their own circumstance, whether they try to use some of these drugs that are approved for another indication um, but, you know, Tony Fauci and I would say uh, we think that this, this drug really needs to be evaluated by rigorous clinical trials to see what its role is ultimately therapeutically. And, and I should add that that's been used for malaria, so at least it, it's safe from that perspective for year and for lupus. And it's been um, used for lupus. Uh, it's a drug we know the safety profile very well. Uh, Scientists always look, as you say, you know, see, you know, you're very careful and you want studies and you want trials, and I got that. Um, but if you are sick, and you have coronavirus, and you have placed in front of you remdesivir, convalescent plasma, or hydroxychloroquine, which one are you going to grab right now? Realizing that, you know, six months from now, your answer, maybe even a month from now, will be different. Which one are you going to grab? Well, it depends on where I am. If I'm in the hospital, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to, we call it desaturate, meaning my ability to oxygenate my blood is starting to uh, not work the way it's supposed to, I, I, I hope that the physicians in there will be able to put me on remdesivir. Uh, at this point in time. So, okay, but it may change even in an hour or two from now. I hope, I hope that we're going to hear about convalescent serum and monoclonal antibodies in the next eight weeks, and we're going to have a bigger portfolio. Now the vaccine, I read there's something like 160, 170 places around the world right now looking at a vaccine for the big race. It's like the race to the moon almost. Is that right? A number of places around the world looking at? Yeah, this is the big one. This is clearly, uh, um, I, I want to remind people, I mean, this is, this is the key, biomedical innovation. When I started in my practice of medicine with HIV, my patients had a 10-month survival. Now they can live a natural lifetime. Science is going to solve this problem, okay? But we're in a race right now because clearly this virus has the potential to particularly cost the life of those of us that are vulnerable, that have multiple preconditioned medical conditions. Uh, we've seen, obviously, in our nursing homes, we've seen individuals over the age of 75. Uh, and this virus is clearly not, it's here with us right now. We had hoped that it would dissipate over the summer. We didn't see that. So we're getting ready for the virus in the fall to be com complicated with the flu virus at the same time, which is going to be a difficult time for us where we have both. And so racing uh, to try to make sure we can get an effective vaccine to begin to protect the vulnerable, uh, protect those individuals that are first responders, and then ultimately protect the American public and then the rest of the world is really a goal. And, and when they use the term Operation Warp Speed, this is really a highly accelerated program. Not to undermine scientific integrity, not to cut short the safety. What really has been cut out of the process that usually takes multiple years is the decisions to invest in the product at the time it goes into a phase three trial as if it works to produce it, produce 100 million doses. At the end of the day, we may have a lot of souvenirs from the different vaccines that we bought ahead of time. But the reality is if one or more of these vaccines work, the moment we know it works, the FDA knows it works, 
there'll be 100 million doses of that particular vaccine available to the American people, and we won't have that delay. More of our conversation in a moment. First, some background on Dr. Robert Redfield, who has for more than 30 years been on the front lines of public health, particularly in the areas of viral infections and HIV. Robert Ray Redfield is the current director of the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, and head administrator at the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease. At 69, Dr. Redfield has been on the front lines of public health and research for more than three decades, particularly in the areas of viral infections and HIV. He was founding director of the Department of Retroviral Research in the U.S. military's HIV research program. He served as chief of infectious diseases at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Redfield has made a number of important contributions to our scientific understanding of HIV. That includes the potential for viral transmission among heterosexual couples, which has helped reduce some of the social stigma once associated with HIV AIDS. In addition to his research, Dr. Redfield oversaw an extensive clinical program. It treated more than 5,000 HIV patients in the greater Washington, D.C. area. In 2005, Dr. Redfield was appointed to President George W. Bush's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. And in January this year, he was named one of the key members of President Donald Trump's Coronavirus Task Force. Would you go to a big event and closed, uh, like a concert, a rally, or a, a political con convention, or a church, um, without a mask? And would you go one with one if everyone's wearing a mask? Yeah, and that's the key here. And I think it's an important point for me to emphasize. The key is the mask. If we all, if this whole nation, really decided to make the personal responsibility and sacrifice, like many of our ancestors had to do in World War I and World War II. If we just all did one thing, we all just decided for the next four, six, eight weeks, we're gonna wear masks, all of us, uh, this outbreak would really come to a halt. I mean, the masks really do work. You're gonna see MMWR today from CDC coming out about hair salonists that were infected, but they wore masks and they, were, they didn't see any transmission. We have household contact studies coming out that the households where someone was infected in the household, but they all used the social distancing mask hand washings. We didn't see transmission. If they didn't do that, we saw over 70% transmission. So one of the things I can say for sure, face coverings and mask really work. I tell people, we're not defenseless against this virus. We have one of the most powerful weapons in the world. Even that, the, even, even that mask. little mask, okay? I have a, another one that's a little more you know, stylish. I have but, an N95, I have a this, bunch of those. This little ditzy mask, all right, this is a powerful weapon against this virus, all right? And if we all did this, all right, and we wash our hands, and we have vigilance about closing operations that promote irresponsible behavior, I'm a big advocate of closing bars right now because I think the, People that spend too much time in bars uh, are not social distancing, they're not wearing their mask, and they're not uh, optimizing what I'm asking them to do is to be part of the solution. But we could actually bring this down. We could, we could defeat this enemy if everyone just made a commitment for the next four, five, six, seven, eight weeks to really be vigilant about wearing a mask. We know this now works. I wish I knew it worked six months ago. I didn't know it worked six Why months ago. Why didn't we know six months ago I, that it worked? Because we didn't have the data. Again, CDC, unfortunately, and fortunately, is not an opinion organization. It's an organization that is science-based, data-driven. We've got to get the science and data. You'll see we're coming out with an MMW today. I have an editorial today in, in, in JAMA, the uh, American Medical Journal, Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, again, ab about the importance of the fact that the mask works. So wear a mask wash your hands, all right? Don't decide right now, particularly the millennials and the Generation X, you know, take a, take a break for the bars right now. And I don't want people to close the bars just to go in their home and have a big gathering in their home, okay? Because at least, you know, I don't want that either. I really want uh, people to take this seriously. Uh, I had hoped that the summer was gonna be 
uh, easier for us. It's clearly not. We don't know this virus. I think the thing that I keep trying to repeat when people ask me, what do you predict? The fact is I can't predict. I don't know this virus. I know flu. Let me ask you one last question, and it's because we have a large African audience here, is that um, a colleague, former colleague of yours, not Dr. Robert Gallo, uh, talked to me about um, bridge vaccines and the live polio vaccine, which we don't use here in the United States and haven't since 1997, but is used in Africa, as well as the TB uh, vaccine, as a temporary sort of bridge vaccine. And as I understand it, it doesn't deal directly with coronavirus, but it tells your immune system to do something special in the short run so you don't get the coronavirus. Um, is there any, do you have any thought on this bridge vaccine? Because it's cheap, it's 12 cents a dose. Well, I think it's a great idea. I've told Bob this myself. I mean, it's actually based on an observation that was made uh, by colleagues of his parents in, in, the so in, in Russia, the Soviet Union, many years ago, where they received the uh, polio vaccine, the Sabin vaccine, during an influenza epidemic. And it was observed that the people that had been the vaccine recipients didn't get severe flu. Are we seeing that in Africa, where they're using well, this I particular polio vaccine? Is there... Uh, are they having a less incidence you know, of really, COVID-19? It's, it's really important because you point out some of the, some of the sideline tragedies of this pandemic. Because one of the things that's happened in Africa is these immunization programs have been curtailed. So right now, most African children are not going to die from coronavirus. I told you, it's not that pathogenic, but over 120 million haven't gotten their measles vaccine. And measles kills, all right? So I do believe the idea that Bob's talked about viral interference, where you give a live RNA product uh, and that product replicates, it may teach the cells to develop some dementia mechanisms when another RNA virus comes in that it makes it so that RNA virus can't commit its life cycle. Very recently, something was similar said about BCG too, that live product to see if that does it. So I'm an advocate. I know our people are, going, are looking at those individuals that are getting polio vaccine now and are getting measles vaccine, what are we seeing difference about uh, the occurrence of coronavirus? But I think it's, uh, you know, he's an innovative scientist for more than 60 years. I think it's something that warrants being pursued. And the last thing is that you can't get the virus if you don't come in contact with it. Can't get it's the virus. It's impossible to get it if you don't come in contact with it. That's an important point, which I mean, people are afraid of it, but if you, if you wear your masks, you stay far away, you don't come near the virus, you're not getting it. I want to come back to that, that while people worry, and I have 11 grandkids, you know, I have one grandchild with cystic fibrosis. Um, um, I think people need to have enormous comfort that they've got a lot of power to prevent this virus from entering themselves, the vulnerable people they love, and their children. It's just a change. And, you know, a lot of people didn't think the American society was going to adapt to mask, you know, but the fact is, uh, from my travel when I was in North Carolina yesterday, I didn't see a single person in the airport or on the airplane or in, uh, in the Mecklenburg area that I was walking, actually, that wasn't wearing a mask. I think it's, the, the people are getting it. And I just want to make sure that we reinforce that, uh, that this is a powerful weapon. If we do this, we can get this outbreak under control. time we have and my thank you to CDC director Dr. Robert Redfield and for more on this story and the latest news from around the globe please visit our website at voanews.com and follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.